Well, today is Father's Day, so I want to wish a happy Father's Day to everybody in the room. I will never forget the day when my first child was born, and they put this little bundle in my arm. Man, they're little. But she opened her eyes wide and looked at me like, who are you and what is going on here? And that has been the way my eldest has been her entire life. I was not prepared for how much I loved and adored my daughter. I mean, I, I didn't have a way to anticipate that. And then we had a second daughter. And I was a little bit concerned. I thought, how am I going to have enough love inside of me to love the second one like I did the first one? And then they put my second daughter in my arms. And I'm telling you what, it's like they op- uh, God opened up a brand new uh, capacity to love. And I loved her just as much. And that happened all the way through. And we have five kids. It is my favorite, most challenging job in the world to be a father. This Yesterday, my son called me from California with his little baby girl, and he wished me happy Father's Day as I got to watch him be a father to his little girl. You know, he said something to me that really got my attention. He says, you know, Dad, uh, man, she's cute. She's so much fun, and she's cute, but man, she is naughty. (laughs) He says, I sure am hoping I'm doing a good job at being a father, but I'm not really sure, but I really want to do a good job. You know what? That summarizes how I feel. I have not been a perfect father. Please don't interview my children today, okay? But there is nothing like sitting across the room from your child and seeing tears in their eyes because you've disappointed them, or you've done the wrong thing, you said the wrong thing, you weren't the example that you needed. Man, I want to be their hero. Man, I want to be their example. I want to get it right, because my kids matter so much to me. Today, I've got good news. We are all looking for a perfect father, and we have one. When Jesus introduced us to the whole idea of how we were going to pray. This is what he taught us. He says, I want you to pray this. Our, you know what it is? Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's what I want to talk to, to you about today. God presents himself to us as our Father. And when you think about who God is, So many things could go through your mind. Is he some kind of an impersonal cosmic force that we are compelled to obey and follow because we've got no other choice? I mean, is God like immense light, energy, something divine, um, but he doesn't have a name or a face or a heart? Or that, That is not at all how we discover who God is. Some people think that God is kind of like a caricature of an old grandfather, You know, not to disparage grandpas in the room, because I am one now. But the idea is some sweet old guy that's been around a long time. He can't program the TV remote, and he needs his grandkids to fix his computers. He's a sweet old guy, but not very relevant to life. So they don't really go to him for help and guidance You know, I grew up in a country that everybody went to church. It was more of a ritualistic kind of Christianity. And my friends, they would go to church. And it was kind of like we got to show up from time to time. Because in case God is watching, I want him to notice that I did come once in a while. In case in the end, I'm going to need him. Some people see God as like this divine principle that walks around with a ruler in hand ready to bop you on the head when you get it wrong. Kind of like my piano teacher, she would sit sit beside me and I would play my piece uh, and she had her nice, big, brand new, sharpened pencil in her hand and any time I made a mistake, she'd whack my finger. Sometimes we think that's who God is. Some, some people think that, that God is just pretty much angry about everything and anyone. And 
You don't want to really want to come to church because God's not any fun. He's always mad. And if I go to church, he's probably going to be there and they'll just be angry at me there. So why bother? Some people think that God is like a divine helper. Even atheists call upon God in a time of trouble. But what does Jesus have to say? Jesus says, of all the things God could be, I want you to know he's your father. From the beginning, God revealed himself to human beings. There's the story of Enoch who walked with God and Noah who found favor with God. Uh, There was Daniel who chose to honor God rather than the king. Joseph chose to live a righteous life uh, because God had given him a dream and he had an idea that God was going to use him. I mean, but then Jesus comes and when he reveals God to us, we understand according to the scripture that Jesus himself was God. I mean, he was the divine revelation of God in the flesh. And Jesus, 189 times in the four Gospels alone, talks about the fact that God is our Father, our Father who art in heaven. He is hallowed. Um, Jesus said about himself, I and the Father are one. He calls him Father. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We read about the the Trinity. The amazing thing about God is he reveals himself to us that God is in relationship even within the Trinity. And when Jesus came and he was baptized, All of a sudden, bursting out of the sky comes a voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's amazing. I mean, Jesus, he hadn't done any miracles. He hadn't fed the hungry or healed the sick or cast the demons out. He hadn't preached his greatest sermons or taught his greatest lessons. He had not gone to the cross yet and paid for the sin of the world. At the very beginning of his life and ministry, when he is baptized, God proclaims for everyone to hear, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus did not live his life in order to get the blessing of the Father. Jesus was sent on mission with the blessing of the Father. And this is an important thing for all of us who are fathers to understand. All kids need their father's attention and approval. I'll never forget taking my kids and swimming and when there's five of them and there's, they're little, they're, they all are standing up on the side of the pool and saying, hey dad, watch me, I'm gonna dive. And so they jump into the pool and, and I'm like, wow, that's great. And then the, the next one says, how about me dad, watch me. And so like, I have like five kids jumping into the pool, some of whom are so little, I'm afraid they're gonna drown. So I'm running over there to pick them out of the water. And, and while I'm doing that, the other one who just jumped says, dad, you didn't look at me. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but I was saving your sister. No, that doesn't matter. Kids crave the attention and the blessing and the love of a father. And we need the approval of our fathers. We need for our fathers to believe in us. And if we don't have our father's approval, it's like something is missing. It's like the foundation we need for our entire life has something missing. There's like this father gap that's not there. Uh, I'm not sure I'm okay if I don't have the blessing of my father. But if I do have the blessing of my father, I think I can walk with confidence and, and I don't have to worry that I'm deficient in some way because my dad told me I was okay and I felt that blessing. This is such a powerful relationship. And Jesus, when he was launched into ministry, was given the blessing of the father even before he had done anything. Fathers, Send their, who send their kids out blessed do a fine job. A kid launched out having been given that blessing is a kid that has the strength to move into their future. Jesus and the Father were close. I mean, you, you look at, the, it's, it's an interesting kind of mysterious thing, the Godhead. But Jesus long to spend time with the father that's why he would disappear and go out to the mountains and pray he wasn't 
praying to the Father because he had to pray to the Father. It's almost as if Jesus delighted in spending time with just him and the Father. And he would say things like, I only do what the Father tells me to do. The only miracles that I, I want to do are the ones that my Father has di directed me to do. There was this close, intimate <clears throat> relationship between Jesus and the Father. Jesus was the Son of God, and the relationship was defined as a father and a son. And then Jesus declares to us, so when you pray, pray our Father. You know, it's interesting, Jesus did not, did not keep that relationship to himself. I mean, I can hear kids saying, hey, you can't call my dad father, he's not your father. He, of course. God could have said, yeah, I'm special because my father is God. But he didn't do that. He said, God is my father and I'm here to tell you when you pray, you too can pray to him, our father. 1 John 3, 1 to 3 says this. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. I mean, just think about that. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I mean, do you see the transformative power in being settled in a relationship with God where he is the father and you are the child? You're not earning anything. You are receiving the goodness of a perfect father and knowing that he is your father and knowing that he continues to work in your life actually purifies you and makes you better. You're not earning it. You're not deserving it. He's giving it to you. This is a powerful thing that God is our father. And Jesus says, I want you to know that's who he is to you. Number two, um, we are all imperfect fathers. I don't know if you're a father here today, if you'd admit that. I bet you would. You know what? The evil one has been trying from the very beginning of time to separate us from our fathers. Actually, Malachi, the very last verses of the Old Testament Malachi 4, 5 to 6 says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what is this prophet going to do? What's the focus? What is the primary issue he's going to deal with? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So wh wh what in the world? I mean, this, this lack of unity between the fathers and the children is so primary in, in this last prophetic word before we get to the New Testament, that is going to be the agenda. And then Jesus comes and Jesus says, actually, I am here and I am here to tell you that there is a perfect father, the God who created you, who wants to be in a relationship with you. I'm going to turn the hearts of the children to the father. And the heart of the father is already turned to the children. I don't probably need to tell you that there um, are no perfect fathers and that um, a lot of people have been deeply wounded because of that relationship. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You, you, you can be deeply wounded um, and your father be gone. Louis Giglio wrote a book called Not Forsaken and in that book he identifies six kinds of earthly dads. And listen to this list that he identifies. Number one, some people grow up with an absent father. Maybe you grew up with an absent father. I mean, from the very beginning, you say, my, my father wasn't there. You know, my father is absent, but this is the first time in my life that my father is not present because he passed away on the 24th of December last year. So my father is absent, but my father is with the Lord and all is well with him. 
And that, that, while there is, a, there is an absence there, there is a joy and an expectation that one day I'm going to see him and we've not really been separated. But there are some of you whose father was absent because he just wasn't around. You might say he left me. Uh, maybe it was divorce or abandonment. And you may have been told by a father, you know, I'm, I'm not divorcing your mother because of you. It's, you're not the problem. But then you always wondered if it might have been part of it. The second father that he identifies is the abusive father. An abusive father is not, is not just not there. He's actively hurting you emotionally, verbally, or even physically. An abusive father does great damage to a child. The third kind of father that Louis Giglio identifies is the performance-based father. This is the father that will bless you if you will perform first. If you perform well, you get the blessing. Um, I, I will love you more if you do well. Every moment of your life is a performance event. Do well and get the blessing. Don't perform well and get a scolding and get the disappointment of your father. The fourth one is a passive father. You know what a passive father is? A passive father is a, is a father who is there, but he's kind of like a non-player. I mean, he's in the house, but he's not really part of the story. He's not taking the initiative. He's not stepping in to lead. He's not having the hard conversations. He's not speaking life into you. He, he, he's not telling you what the limits are and what the boundaries are because a, a passive father often wants more than anything just to be your friend, to get the approval of the child, and they won't risk a hard conversation in a passive father. Some of you have had an antagonistic father. Louis Giglio uh, says that an antagonistic father is the father who is in competition with you. Have you ever had a parent who's in competition with you? I mean, they don't ever really want you to succeed that well because they want to succeed more than you did. An antagonistic father diminishes you and tells you how you're not living up and his goal is to beat you in the game of life. He's not for you to succeed. I mean, really, the right response would be a father should want a child to succeed even beyond what they have accomplished. Number six is the empowering father, which is what we all want to be. An empowering father is not perfect. No dad's perfect. Um, but an empowering father loves his children. He will correct them. And there may be tension in that correction, but the tension is there because he hopes for a better future for them. He wants to train them for success. He rebukes, and while there may be a sting, grace always goes first. They feel protected. This dad loves so well, even in his imperfection, his kids believe that they have a future and they know that they have value and they feel the blessing of their father. They know even if they fail, their dad will be the first person there to pick them up and help them start all over again. The passive dad never confronted. No boundaries, no limits. And the children begin to wonder, you know what? You, you, you weren't willing to take a risk to protect me? An empowering dad will step in and lead. He will correct. He will give limits and boundaries. He will say things like, you will not speak to your mother in a disrespectful tone in this house. In this house, we will respect and honor everyone, and it's going to begin with your mom. Kids may not like the rules of the house. They may fight the rules of the house. But kids know that parents with rules, limits, and truth love them and they're willing to put the relationship at risk to have those conversations and establish that culture. We all know that only people who truly love us will stop us from hurting ourselves and destroying our future. This is a kind of jealous and powerful love that the empowering father has. You know, if you had a father who was passive, 
or absent or abusive or demanding or antagonistic. You feel the hurt. Even right now as I speak, it may still be a little tender. What's going on? What's going on is that we were designed for a primary relationship with God in heaven who is the perfect father we long for. He is the father we need. You know, lastly, we need to ask God to be our father. Here's the story of God on Father's Day. He knows that we need a good father, a perfect father. He knows that we don't have this even in the best of our fathers. It has been a struggle for families from the beginning. God, however, is not content to leave us with our wounds and the holes in our heart. And so he comes in and he says, if you will ask me, I will be the father you're looking for. I love Psalm 68. Psalm 68, listen to this psalm. Sing to the Lord, sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in family. So what, what does God do? God says, I don't want anyone in this world to live a fatherless life. I don't want you to remain with the disappointment, the pain, and the holes in your soul that occurred because your father wasn't able to meet those needs. It is my plan to not leave you fatherless. And so here we have Almighty God come riding in the clouds, rushing up to you, saying, I will be your father. I will be everything you need. I'll never abandon you. I am righteous and holy, and I will never abuse you. I'm not in competition with you. I... I seek your success and your blessing. I just need you to accept me. Matthew chapter seven, verse seven, it, Jesus teaches once again this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, I'm here to say that I think the vast majority of fathers and parents do everything within their power, even to the point of sacrificing, to make sure that then when their son or daughter needs bread, they get a piece of bread and not a rock. That when they need fish, they, they will not give a serpent. But it is, I mean, even, even ordinary fathers seek to do good to their children. And Jesus uses that as a springboard to say, What do you need today? Ask the Father. What do you need today? Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Why? Because God is not an impersonal divine power the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth. He wants to be your father. He loves you. 
what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Isn't that incredible? Romans chapter 8, 14 and 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. God wants to be our Father. He's the perfect Father. He will always forgive when you ask. He will walk with you at all times. He will teach you and tell you hard things. He will, he will have tense conversations. Have you ever felt the conviction of God? That, that, why does God do that? He does that because he believes in us and he wants to bless us and lead us along the right path. He wants to protect us and provide for us. He is our father and he owns heaven and eternal life. And getting saved is not about getting a get out of hell free card. It's, it's not about getting a pass into heaven. Getting saved, accepting Jesus Christ is about getting a relationship with God who will walk with us every single day, who will meet all of our needs. This is what the gospel is all about. You know, some of you have been abused by your fathers and the pain is so great it still haunts you and makes you wonder if you're okay. Some of you are abandoned and you don't know if you're good enough for, for God to stick around. Some of you feel like you've been constantly disappointing God. You're not good enough or smart enough or athletic enough or beautiful enough. You, you seem to fall short every step of the way. But today, God wants to step into our lives, into your life and be the perfect father your, your soul longs to have. You need to let God be that father. Psalm 103, it's almost as if David is just kind of contemplating God's role in his life. And he burst out with this incredible psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And then he begins to enumerate certain things he feels like God does for him. Verse three, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. In verse eight, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. You can come to church any Sunday you want. You don't have to worry about him ready to explode and being angry at you. No, no. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Praise God for that. Nor punished us according to our iniquities. As high as the, hev as, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you ever can I can I tell you what's really tough about being a pastor? Sometimes I don't get everything right. I, my basement flooded with sewer water and I have not been a very good man. That makes me mad. Sometimes I don't have the kind of patience I need to have, the kindness and the graciousness that is, I know is right. And then you know what I have to do? I have to get up here on this stage. You know, the only way I can ever do this is because I don't get it right all the time. But I am a pilgrim who has found a God who will forgive me and remove my sins as far as the east is from the west. Man, I... 
the only way I can do what I do is the grace of God. The only way you can survive life is the grace of God. And the good news is, you know that sin you're still thinking about right now? If you've confessed it, he has, moved, has removed it as far as the east is from the west because he is a good father and he says, I know, I saw it, I get it, but we're done with that. I've forgiven you. Would you get up and let's keep going into the good future I have planned? As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And that word pity there doesn't just mean he thinks you're so needy. It, it's an expression of great love and compassion. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. It's never gonna go away. It's never going to be used up. There will be more again tomorrow. And in fact, it will last for all of eternity. So, on this Father's Day, we remember that there is a perfect Father who sent his son Jesus to pay the price for our sins so that we could be saved. First John, listen to these verses. In the beginning was the word, capital W, that's Jesus. And the word was, was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jump down to verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him but as many as received him to them gave him. He the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. God wants to be your father. He is the perfect father. What do you have to do? You receive Jesus Christ and you ask God for the salvation through his son Jesus and ask to be his child. He will satisfy our deepest longings. He will give us the power to endure the pain and the loss and the wounds of our earthly fathers and to love again and it's magnificent. Josh McDowell um, was a man who considered himself an agnostic. He truly believed that Christianity was worthless. However, when challenged to intellectually examine the claims of Christianity, Josh discovered compelling and overwhelming evidence for the reliability of the Christian faith. And after trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, Josh's life changed dramatically as he experienced the power of God's love. He became a well-known and articulate speaker. Actually, Josh McDowell has spoken to over 46 million people. He's given 27,200 talks in 139 countries. This is Josh McDowell. In 1960, uh, since 1960, he has written or co-authored 151 books in 128 languages. His book, More Than a Carpenter, has over 27 million copies out. Evidence that demands a verdict of a book that I read as a young man that changed my life was considered one of the 20th, the 20th century's top 40 books. One of the most influential books in the last 50 years on Christian thought by World Magazine. But this is Josh McDowell's story. After I became a Christian, guilt came in. I recognized God as a God of love and he wanted me to love my dad. The one person I hated more than anyone else in this world was my father. I despised him. To me, he was was the town alcoholic. 
If friends were coming over, I would take my father, tie him up in the barn and park the car around the silo. To avoid embarrassment, we would tell our friends he had to go somewhere. They, he hid his father in the barn, tied up. About five months after he made a decision to follow Christ, a love for his father, a love from God through Jesus Christ inundated Josh's life. Josh said, it turned my hatred upside down. It enabled me to look my father squarely in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. And that really shook him up. While in college, Josh was in a serious accident and was taken home and his neck was in traction. His father came into his room and asked, Son, how can you love a father like me? Josh said, Dad, six months ago, I despised you. Then he shared with him about Jesus Christ. Dad, I let Jesus come into my life. I can't explain it completely, but as a result of this relationship, I found the capacity to love and accept not only you, but other people just the way they are. 45 minutes later, his father said, Son, if God can do in my life, what I've, what I've seen him do in yours, then I want to give him the opportunity. His father prayed and with Josh and trusted Christ as Savior. Josh's father never touched alcohol, only once after that. He got it as far as his lips, and that was it. He didn't need it anymore. Fortunately, Josh did not withhold his love from his father, but he allowed the love of God, his father, to transform him and to change him. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us enough to express his love for us, even to die for us, in order to bring us into a relationship with God where we call him Father. Can I ask you to bow your heads, please? Maybe you're here today and um, you have father wounds. And they're real and you can't deny them and the scars are there and it's hard and it's difficult and God's not asking you to, to ignore that. But what he is saying is if, you'll, if you will receive me as your father, I will fill up the holes of your soul. I will transform you. I will make you new. I will be that God who will never leave you or forsake you. I'll be that father that will believe in you and forgive you and never give up on you. I will be the God that loves you with an everlasting love. I don't want you to just be one other person in heaven one day. I want to be your father right now. And when you get to heaven, you'll be in the Father's house. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just want to tell you the most amazing thing you could ever do, even right now, would be to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you'd let me, I'd like to lead you in a prayer right now and simply say, God in heaven, I want you to be my father. Would you tell him that? God, would you please be my father? I've got stuff in me that needs to be fixed and holes that need to be filled and wounds that need to be made right. And so God, I am admitting to you that I need you to be my father. And I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross, to pay the price so that I could become your child. So right now I ask for forgiveness and I invite you into my life. Jesus, save me today. And I don't think any of us ever get to the place where we don't need the daily constant presence 
of a loving, patient, truth-telling God who is our Father. Do you still need him? Tell him you do. Just say, God, I want to walk with you today. If you'll come and help me, I sure do need you still. I always will. Help me today, I pray. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to give an invitation. Trevor and I are going to be down here in the front. If somebody wants to pray with us, we'd be glad to do that. Um, but before we do that, I think God, the Father, wants to bless you. You know, a man in this church, second service, a few weeks ago, and I mentioned that we had a memorial service for my father. He came and found me after the service. He says, hey, I, I just want to tell you something. I'm here to say, because your father can't, that I am sure your father is pleased with you. <laughs> wow. It was like a blessing from the Lord on that day. You know what? I received it. And today, I want to I give you a blessing. And it comes out of Numbers chapter 6. And we've done this before, but I think it's really a great thing to do more often than less. Would you lift, put your hands out and receive this blessing? Will you do that? Come on. Do you still need a good godly father, a good father in heaven? This was the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And if you'll receive it, just say amen. God, we thank you for being so good to us, more than we deserve. Now we pray that you'd bless even the ending of this service. If there's someone here that would be helped by letting us pray with them, we pray that you would, you would just make that moment happen. And we worship you today as God, our Father. And we're never going to stop needing you. So thank you for being here again today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.